I'll wait on the cue from the video guy. This talk is this talk is so good you won't want to miss a second of it. <laughs> or watch it because you don't remember it. Uh, watch it again. So, all right, it's eleven o'clock Sunday DerbyCon, the the dream time slot for uh, for every presenter. Um, no, seriously, I'm I'm glad to be here. My name is Russell Butterini. This is Fireway Sinking the Next Generation Firewall. So before we get started, how many people are familiar with or know what I'm talking about when I say next generation firewall? Okay, pretty good amount. You know, if you're not or you won't need a review, uh, then we're, we're going to talk about it. And if you already are, then you can tune out. But um, cool. So we'll get started. Um, I am the pen test on the pen test team at a large healthcare company. I see one, two, three of my coworkers and probably some I haven't met who are here. Um, anything I say or do in this talk is representing me and not my employer. Uh, I love when you go to security conferences, people won't tell you where they work in their presentation, but then you just go look at LinkedIn and find out where they work afterwards, which is pretty awesome. So uh, don't take it out on them. Uh, I've been doing IT, IS, um, fun stuff like that for um, 12 years. A little bit of everything, sysadmin, uh, web app hacking, pen testing, firewall administration, IPS, antivirus, DLP, uh, Active Directory, uh, you know, grab bag of stuff. Uh, two years ago at Derby County, I presented a tool called NoSQL Map, which someday I will work on again, maybe, if time permits. And I'm the world's worst PowerPointer. So uh, pro tip, uh, black text on a white background works on every projector in the world. And I'm not artistic enough to find any other color combination that works. So uh, these will be really boring slides. So before we get started, I want to give you a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, I am not going to show you crazy NSA leak, zero-day firewall hacks in this talk. What I'm going to show you are things that are fundamental flaws in the way that the firewall is designed and the premises the products are built on. Um, it, it's great for us, right, because... That means this isn't simply a patch and it's fixed or a firmware update and it's fixed. These are things that are broken in the product and probably are not going to be fixed. Um, there's one particular vendor that you all will recognize as we get into the slides. Anybody touch the next-gen firewall will recognize that we're going to pick on for the sake of example, but they pretty much all work the same way. And I've talked to this vendor about these problems. The other people have talked to this vendor about these problems. And the vendor apparently says, oh, yeah, that's pretty much how it works. Not going to be fixed, so uh, so that's pretty great. Um, so, little review, little little primer for uh, if you are you know new to firewalls. Uh, a traditional firewall filters at layer three and layer four. Now, when I say layer three and layer four, who knows what I'm talking about? Call it out. Okay, the OSI model, right? Very good. Um, so that means we're filtering on things like IP, port, things like that. Maybe depending on uh, your firewall vendor, I know the ASA will do like uh, layer two uh, a little bit, do some limited deep packet inspection for very specific things that you configure it to look for, but mostly your filtering is going to be in layer three and layer four. Um, rules are built to you let traffic out. The firewall dynamically opens ports to let traffic back in based on what it observes in the uh, connection setup, and uh, it's pretty much permit deny. Um, I think that it's important to remember too that when you're thinking about um, traditional firewalls versus next-gen firewalls, they're very context-based, uh, next-gen firewalls are. So in traditional firewalls, traffic always looks the same. So it's things like IPs, ports, things that don't change a lot. So the way the traffic appears to the firewall is very, very static. And then, of course, you get NAT and PAT and routing and all the other fun stuff that you need to uh, stick something in your network. So the advantages, quote-unquote, that you'll get with a next-gen firewall it's things like uh, you can filter from layer 2, so this would be MAC address layer, for example, all the way into layer 7, which is the juicy stuff, the payload, the data that's being delivered as the uh, traffic goes across the wire. Um, at least that's what salespeople will tell you. Uh, rules, and this is a whole separate talk, you have the, still have the principles of static context, so IPs and subnets and VLANs and uh, ports, things like that, but you also have dynamic objects. So... You take data from external sources like DNS, like um, Active Directory event logs, like wireless controller event logs, like captive portal authentication. You feed it to the firewall, and it ties that data back to um, IP-based traffic by parsing out, well, this authentication attempt came from Joe at IP 192.168.1.5 uh, if to Active Directory. So if I see traffic for from that IP, I'm going to type to Joe, and I can build rules. But Joe can move around the network a lot, right? So... So your uh, your contexts are very dynamic. Um, I think of next-gen firewalls as more of a, a decision device rather than just a filtering device. 
because there's a lot of different things you can do based on what that packet looks like. And it could be something as simple as DLP. It could be QoS. It could be route changes, all kinds of different stuff. Um, and then, of course, you get the, the salesperson buzzword bingo, APT, threat intelligence, uh, threat prevention, um, you know, all that fun stuff. Cyber. We got to say that. So as security practitioners, we're also here like, oh, man, this is awesome. I mean, this firewall is going to dig down deep into every packet, right? And it's going to look at it and it's going to match a very, very specific set of characteristics that we specify. And uh, if it uh, doesn't match, then we're just going to drop it. And if the, we're going to look at the response coming back and if the response doesn't look like it should, then we're going to drop it and it's going to be great and no traffic is going to ever leave the network and, you know, it's going to be awesome. So um, what I'm going to tell you is that is not exactly true. And um, some guys, uh, and I got a couple of references in the talk. Uh, when when Next Gen Firewalls first sort of started becoming mainstream back in 2012, uh, Brad Woodberg and Dave LaSalle, Brad did a talk at DEF CON 19, and Dave did a talk at NOLASEC. And they sort of started to scratch the surface on some of these issues and how these uh, how these firewalls work. But um, and I'll have the references for those talks at the end if you want to check those out as well. But they, they um, like I said, they scratched the surface, and they, like me, talked to the vendor, and the vendor said, yeah. That's pretty much how it works. So here we are four or five years later, same uh, issue still exist. So why can't we do what the firewall vendor says this is going to do? It's too expensive computationally, and it's too expensive network latency-wise, right? I mean, you can't sit and hold a packet indefinitely while you scroll through a database of 35,000 applications looking for the app ID signature, okay? I, you know, you can't sit and hold the response to that in that connection of the traffic coming back inbound indefinitely while you're looking to make sure it fits a very particular pattern. I mean, you're going to run the, you're on the CPU up on the management plane of the firewall, right? And you're also going to introduce a tremendous amount of network latency. And in security, what wins? Security or performance? Performance always wins, right? The second piece of that is rule management, if you did that, would be insane. <laughs> you know, you'd be trying to try to permit just very, very specific things, and you'd have a 10,000 rule rule base, and um, yeah. So the next gen firewall will take some shortcuts, and um, the first thing it does is it will actually allow unrestricted traffic flow if you're using App ID. I think other vendors may call some different App ID is that layer seven inspection until the firewall sees enough traffic to figure out what type of uh, app is flowing through the firewall. Now, the second point is really, really, really important. The firewall generally will look at traffic going out. It will not care about what comes back in. And we're going to have some fun with that here in a little bit. Um, assumptions, layer four attributes. So a uh, great example of this is uh, this particular vendor's firewall, and I've seen some others that do it as well. If you send something on port 443 and the firewall can't clearly figure out what it is, it assumes it's SSL. So if you have a rule that permits SSL and you want to like base 64 encode a file and send it out and the firewall can't read it, oh, this is SSL, that's fine. Let it go. <laughs> and um, the like we talked about, there's a lot of performance trade-offs in, uh, in GFWs. So if uh, you're trying to match an app, it's you can only work on so many characteristics. And there's a couple of reasons for that we'll get into a little bit later. So a little more visual example, this is the OSI model. It's a thing you all learned for your CCNA and then promptly forgot after you passed the test. Um, but I want you to think about, I, I like this because it's a top, it's a bottom down, so application, the layer seven to one. And I want you to think about those layers at the bottom in orange, one, two, three, and four. You have to build all that before you get to layer seven to do the inspection. So I'm seeing some nodding and some guys, I think you guys are kind of seeing where there's going to be some problems with this, right? So... I'm going to give you an example, and for those of you who have ever worked in Next Gen Firewall, probably know exactly what vendor we're talking about now. Uh, <laughs> this is the Skype signature from this, uh, this vendor's firewall. Um, and I, the key part of this is I want you to look at the line that says standard ports, TCP dynamic and UDP dynamic. That's their code word for any. So if you have a rule, and this is Skype, but there's a number of different apps like that. Uh, if you have a rule that, uh, allows this app out the firewall, it's going to allow any traffic out on any port until it sees enough data to figure out this is or is not Skype. So, and like I said, it's not it's not limited, just this app. And it's also the same if you, uh, say, have an app that allows traffic out on a certain port, say you want to allow Facebook photos, I, I don't know, something like that. 
it's going to allow all the connections out until it makes a decision on whether or not it is that app. So uh, this is my Tom Petty reference. For some reason, I started putting Tom Petty references in every one of my talks. I realized after about four talks, I've done, I've done it, and that's just a tradition now. So into the great wide open. Uh, all the connections in this vendor's firewall start as insufficient data. That's an app type that's specified in there, which means I don't know what this app is. And so you can't block it. And um, you have to allow the full con connection handshake out. You have to pass some data. And this some data, uh, the amount of data varies per app. So some apps, two or three packets. Oh, yeah, it's, it's good. It's not this app. Move on to the next rule. Some apps, it takes 10, 12 packets. So I've got some Python code and some tools for auditing this stuff and playing with it, and uh, I hope you all enjoy it. Uh, if you, you can get it there, I'll have this slide at the end if you want to um, just get it off there and my contact information. But it's a, it's a POC test kit. Uh, it is a, there's a client piece of server keys, uh, server piece rather, excuse me, uh, called Fire, it's tools called Fireway. And I had intended to do a live demo here, and I borrowed a piece of equipment from my friend, uh, who's a, a Palo Alto sales guy, and I burned the storage up in it in two days, and it died. So we're stuck with screenshots, but I assure you, if you take this, uh, it, it will work. Um, so. so the first thing I, I want to talk about is testing this principle of a closed port. So say we have a set of layer four ports that we allow out, and we have other ports, but we have other app ID rules where maybe we're uh, allowing some traffic out and trying to match on a layer 7 attribute instead of a layer 4 or layer 3 attribute. So you could start the Fireway server on some past the decision point of the firewall, say the internet, if this is your egress firewall, for example. And, you know, it's pretty simple. Start up on whatever port. Okay, and then the, inside the firewall, you launch the client and you point it at your server you started up. Um, there are two modes for the client. Mode 0, which is just send random data in incrementally larger chunks per connection and see how the firewall responds. And the server will also give you some feedback as to how much data it's um, it's receiving. Or you can actually uh, open a file and extract it out the network on a closed port, which is pretty cool too. Um, and you, you specify the, the size of the chunk. So once you've run your test with uh, mode zero, you can actually uh, specify like, oh, I want to send the file in 200 byte chunks because I know the firewall's filtering doesn't kick in until it sees 4K of data, something like that. So you basically chunk the file up, the server reassembles it for you, and it's, it's very nice. So, um, yeah, this, okay, show up good. Uh, so there's the syntax for the client. So we start it in mode zero. This is a port that's not allowed out the firewall. Uh, we start with, say, testing 50 bytes of data. On each new connection, we're going to send five more bytes of uh, data. So 50, 55, 60, et cetera, up to 4K. And so you see what's happening on the um, server. Uh, this is the, the client is on the left, the server is on the right. Now what's happening, this is a different example, but the um, client is sending about 100 bytes of data incrementally. The server is watching, and what it's looking for is if it gets the same or a lower amount of data on two concurrent connections. If it does, it warns you, then because that way you know the firewall filtering has kicked into effect somewhere and it started to clamp down on your connection because you've sent more data than the app ID uh, will let you send. So what does this look like while the firewall is, um, is uh, or this traffic is going through the firewall? And what's wonderful is the firewall writes logs out of order. And I'm going to tell you something else really funny about this screenshot too. So you see there's actually incrementally larger amounts of data. We have the application type set as insufficient data. So this is firewall saying, I don't know what this is. Now, this is really funny. I wrote a rule to allow ping. Now, I'm not saying ICMP. I'm saying ping. So this is an app ID rule that's supposed to allow only echo and echo reply. That app signature will let you stand up a full TCP handshake, transmit data across it, and close it down, and the firewall can't make a decision on whether that is an echo or echo reply packet or not. So, you know, you tell me. That, that should be like a one packet decision, but, it, but it's not. Um, so. So you see what's happening. We have, we have an app ID signature, a layer 7 signature, or a rule rather, and we're getting traffic out that shouldn't be permitted out because it's on a closed port. Now you see we, it runs. It's still trying to slide, still trying to slide up to about 4K. Hits 5, 6K somewhere in there. It says, yeah, I've seen more data than uh, I feel comfortable saying this, is, uh, this matches the, uh, the ping app signature, and I'm going to start denying the traffic. So, But you still were able to communicate out on a closed port using small chunks of data. So, and then there's just a quick example of moving a file. 
uh, on a closed port. So you start up the client, you mode one, specify your file name, and then your maximum chunk size based on maybe what you found running the test in mode zero. So that's pretty cool, right? I mean, we bypass firewall restrictions. We got an, you know, we got an app out to, or we use an app rule to get data out on a port, but it's kind of noisy. It's not going to fit in with your regular traffic profiles. I'm sure everybody here has a sock who very, uh, carefully looks at NetFlow and, uh, and would see instantly that there was traffic moving on a closed port and, um, cause everybody does that, right? Everybody collects all their NetFlow. Um, so, is there a better tactic? Can we can we hide, you know, a little bit better and uh, take advantage of some other things in this firewall? So this, I'm going to give you an example of what a signature looks like. Now, as far as I know, you can't look at this, this particular vendor, which you all know who it is now, uh, but uh, this particular vendor's database. Uh, but people have written custom signatures that you can get. They have a, a forum, and this was a signature to actually block March Madness streaming basketball, which is, uh, we're in Louisville, so that's offensive, right? Um, but... Uh, Somebody wrote this a couple years ago. Um, you see, the, the criteria for a match is very, 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 very simple. So you have an HTTP method, a URI path, and then down there at the bottom, you have a host header. That is it. And I'm going to tell you something. All these 35,000 apps that it's supposedly matching, that's about it. I'd say 90% of them are web apps. And that it makes sense, right? Because everything on your network right now looks like a web app. It's either some kind of mobile app making RESTful API calls or it's a web app or, you know, everything. HTTP is scalable and it's easy to write and everybody knows it and <laughs> everything looks like a web app. So, so it's, it's fun. We can actually abuse that um, pretty significantly. So assuming we know that this is the criteria that the firewall is looking for to match a particular app signature. What if I open a socket to an IP I own and I send it something like this? And the firewall really don't, it could care less if the, if it's a well formed HTTP request or not. So even though this is a GET request, we can even stack a little data here on the bottom. Now, up to, I found that about five and a half, six K, it'll start saying, yeah, this is not exactly right and dropping the traffic with a GET request. But so let's, let's just send something like this. And I, bear in mind, I don't even have a web server in mind. I just have a raw socket because we're, it doesn't really matter because we're not looking at what's being sent back. It's a one way inspection. So www.linkedin.com, just requesting the root page. I stuck a user agent in there just for fun. The firewall believes that traffic is LinkedIn traffic, even though it went to my IP and I stacked your data on the bottom of it and it just matches an internally allowed app. So. What about something like this? What if we just take a, and this is just some random post crap I pulled out of the Facebook API. That's pretty cool. We have a little more room to work because the body of a post request can look pretty much like anything. I mean, you know, and it can be long, short, you know, we have a little more room to work. Or what if we send it something like this where say we started inspecting the response or strict enforcement of a post request, uh, or, uh, you know, how the body is supposed to look. We we'll just tack extra crap in the HTTP header. The firewall don't care. And the, the answer is, um, or the reason for that is, it would be impossible for these app signature vendors to get you an app signature every time there was a minor change in the way that app or that, uh, that web page or whatever communicated. So if, I don't know, Facebook changes their API key format or their mobile auth key format, you know, the Palo Alto or Barracuda or whatever firewall using, they can't keep up with that. Right? They can't check for that stuff. All they can do is very, very basic checks to see what host are you going to, what page you're requesting, what's the method, you know, and what are you pushing. So, Fireway will do this for you. You can pollute up the logs. You can, uh, it will actually spoof, and this is very basic right now, just, uh, and it looks a lot like that first uh, example should be the GET request. But you can chunk up pieces of a file, send them out, spoofed as different applications, so this is kind of works as under the guise of normal user surfing or activity. And, um, yeah, I mean, it'll, if, if you're sitting in the sock looking at it, it just looks like somebody's browsing the Internet. Oh, and also, I did add this last week. So, because we're making requests for a DNS name in that host header, you, I set it up so you can actually make a DNS request, and it, you know, now you have a DNS request paired with a web request. That's pretty, uh, that's pretty slick. So that that's pretty good, right? I mean, it, it needs a little work because you're sending a bunch of requests. And I mean, I don't know about your users, but I've seen some users who can surf the web pretty fast, but still, 
it, it's not perfect. So you need a little more logic. You need to actually maybe have multiple IPs uh, that you're sending out to. So you're not sending like to link. It's the, it doesn't show up in the logs as LinkedIn to an IP one time, then like YouTube the next time, something like that, or a different type of app. And um, you need to insert delays. Um, so that's all stuff I'm going to work on. Uh, talking to multiple servers, reassembling files and chunks of files that have sent to multiple servers. Those are some things that I'd certainly like to add. One thing I'd also like to add would be um, functionality, almost like BitTorrent, where you're pulling random chunks of a file out instead and transmitting them instead of uh, y- you know sequentially iterating through the file and pulling pulling the chunks out. And the problem with that is if you have we have a, such a finite amount of space to work with. Uh, you know, in, in these spoofed requests that you don't want, and I have to waste space on like a descriptor saying this is piece 48 of a file or whatever. So trying to figure out a workaround for that is, is something I'm going to be working on. So it, to me, I, I think there's one last thing uh, that I think is important to note. Like we've talked about, you don't inspect the response. If you're only inspecting the outbound and never the return, then does this become a command and control channel hidden in plain sight? What prevents me from sending requests that look like legitimate traffic some kind of response comes back that's telling your client on the inside what to do or contains data, you know, I mean, as long as the client understands how to parse it, you know, even if you start inspecting the response like we talked about, it would be impossible for a uh, vendor, NGFW vendor, to keep up with every single app change, right? So anytime there's a content change, heck, just clone the site, put an HTML comment in or something, you know, stupid buried in the web page and it's not going to be checked for as long as the client knows how to go get it then there's no reason that you can't just continue to send this traffic out and your layer 7 inspection will fail or your logging will look like good apps you know so um so i got a few conclusions then we've got some time i think we have a little bit of time for questions i think the room's open too mrs goon can we uh use the room for discussion uh if because the room's open after this if if we need to or um do we need to go out in the hall Oh, she's gonna she's gonna defer. So let me finish it up while she's checking. Um, so uh, layer seven firewalls are awesome. They're in the next logical evolution of, of, of filtering, but understand what you're getting out of them. I think that's the biggest thing. They're only as good as the data they have, whether that's the data from an app signature vendor, or if it's uh, external data. If you're doing some of the user ID uh, rules and things like that, so that's where the decision making is is really. It's only going to be as good as as what it knows to look for, right? Um, Anomaly detection, flow monitoring, net flow analysis, all those things, those are still king. And I think personally, and you, you know, you guys have worked with these five platforms, may have a different opinion. I think rule bases are a lot more complex in these and it's uh, easier to make mistakes. Oh, okay. We do. All right. No problem. We'll go out in the hall if, if there's not time. I think it's a lot easier to make mistakes because your order of rules, if you're blending layer seven rules and layer three, four rules in together, becomes really, really, really important. And like we saw, if you accidentally put a layer seven rule up higher in the order above where your layer three filtering rule is or your layer four filtering rule is, that traffic's gonna be permitted out up to a certain point. So it, it's pretty easy to screw up. And I say that from experience and I've been, I've been working with the um, particular vendors firewall for five years and I know that I made a lot of mistakes along the way like that and we'd have pen testers come in and traffic would bleed out and I, why is this traffic going out and you know that's what it was so that's basically it guys um, I think in what 22 23 minutes so uh, right coming in right about on time save a couple minutes for questions there's the github there's me um, the other talks I talked about there's references look them up I talked to Brad and Dave both before this talk they're great guys uh, and um, you know it's it's cool stuff so if anybody has any questions uh, feel free Yes, sir. Uh, Seven one four. Yeah. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Uh, very much the same way. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's only so much. The question was, uh, do other app control like Blue Coat, uh, and you know, do those things work pretty much the same way? Uh, they're just you're so limited because the apps change faster than the definitions can be updated in in what you can do. And um, I think there's any number of practical applications for this personally, whether it's a DLP, bypassing DLP, um, bypassing web filtering, uh, you know, any, any amount of stuff like that. I think, they're, you know, it's great. So did anybody else have any uh, any other questions, comments? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Yeah, Scott, Scott gets to talk to me on Monday, so he, you can go ahead. Uh, <laughs> 
at all interfere with your things that you brought here? Is that, you know, so if you were you made a rule that made sure that you were using LinkedIn had to be over HTTPS, mm -hmm. would this make it your tool less effective? Or, or yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, the question was, does HTTPS and man in the middle type things uh, to decrypt SSL, uh, does it affect this? And and the answer that I found is, if the firewall can read it, it will make a decision on it. So that's why, uh, say, like you said, you make a rule to make a um, make LinkedIn work over HTTPS, but you're doing SSL decryption on PanOS, for example. Okay, the firewall once it decrypts that SSL, if it and reads what's in it, if it looks like that, even if it's to your bad IP, it will say it's still LinkedIn or whatever, um, because. I mean, pretty much anything it can read, it's going to try to make a dis app ID decision on. So, so it's not coupling into the actual cert on the other side. No, it's not. It's just reading strictly the the body. And again, I, it's there's so many things outside the firewall vendor's control. I think that has a lot to do with it. Yes, Scott. So I had a couple of thoughts. One on top of that, like even if you are doing content inspection, there are certain sites that um, you should not be doing content inspection on. So mm -hmm. for like sites that are uh, HIPAA based or, you know, where you're doing credit card transactions, mm -hmm. like your company should not be uh, decrypting those right. uh, channels so that they wouldn't be able to do that if, since that rule wouldn't be set up. And so that could be right. another way to get a stream in there where they wouldn't be able to do the content inspection, find out what you're actually passing. That's very true. That's very true. thought I was thinking was, like, if you have an app that is expecting a lot of data in and out, right? So mm -hmm. you have like WebEx or Meeting Burner or something like that that you right. know, your company allows. If you do the same sort of thing, if you were running like a uh, SOX proxy and then you wanted to tunnel all that information through a SOX proxy back to you know, your hack station or whatever at your house, um, then you're setting up your own uh, tunnel within a tunnel so that they might even be able to see your tunnel. But I guess would they be able to see that if that's not the right kind of data that it was looking well, for? Here the yeah, and I mean, I think I think that's a, g a good point. Um, and I, I think that if you if you think about, it's all about how your SOC looks at things. I think that and how your monitoring works. So I mean, if say you see a bunch of traffic to LinkedIn that's going to China. You know, that's probably going to be a red flag, right? I mean, it, it, I think also the cloud makes it hard. What if I stand a bunch of servers up on AWS and I spoof some app that's hosted on AWS? Well, if when I do my IP mappings back, you know, my reverse lookups or whatever, if I'm the SOG, I'm like, oh, man, there's a bunch of connections on this IP. Oh, it shows up as AWS. Okay, well, Salesforce or Netflix, whatever, right? That runs on AWS. How do I know whether that's legit or not? Well, now I got to call Amazon. Well, are they going to tell me? I don't know, you know. So I mean, it makes it very, very difficult um, for, to, you know, do the forensic investigation. But uh, but yeah. So um, anything else? All right, awesome guys. Hey, thanks for showing up on Sunday. I appreciate it.